Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Geek Authority Show. I'm your host, Lorenzo Marchese, and this is the show where I talk to all kinds of people in front of and behind the camera or on stage or behind stage or whatever it may be. They, be, they could be actors, writers, producers, directors, cosplayers. Um, and now I have uh, an actor and a publicist with me today, and I'm so thankful for him to uh, be being here. His name is Phil Sokoloff, and he has, I've known him for quite a while. Um, I used to do reviews when theaters were open um, back in the day, in the old days, you know, March. Um, and he uh, sent me lots of uh, PR information on projects that were out there, theaters, uh, as well as all kinds of other stuff. And I would go out and review the shows. So, Phil, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. And, boy, I've got a lot of questions. Oh, great. Fire away. Cool. Okay, here we go. Um, first of all, I understand you started as an actor, and that's pretty much um, where a lot of people have started, and, and the PR thing came later, and so on and so forth. So tell us, uh, at what age, or when did you get the acting bug, or how did you get into it? When I was about three years old, wow. <laughs> I saw wow. I saw Hopalong Cassidy on television and decided, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> really? Well, that was back in the you know, 1950s, and Westerns were what was on television at that time. So uh, the, do we well, the performing first, at three? Were you doing commercials or what? No, no. That's, that's when I decided I wanted to do it. Um, the first professional play I saw was also a Western. Uh, it was like theater for young audiences thing, but they had a, a I guess, a, a traveling group of, uh, it was, it was of, of actors. They did a play called The Mystery of Outlaw Canyon. And that was the first uh, professional play that I saw. And uh, I got my first uh, professional training at the Hedgerow Theater School, which is um, uh, just outside of Philadelphia in the actual, yeah, it's uh, Rose Valley, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia, which is my hometown. And I also uh, studied acting at Temple University. Um, that's where I got my uh, initial training. Um, is that also in Philadelphia? Temple University is in Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then I, I went to, to New York uh, and attended a uh, experimental theater workshop at um, uh, La Mama Experimental Theater Club, a very famous avant-garde theater uh, company there, which is still there. Uh, I do remember. Had, what year was this? What year? What, what were we talking about? What time period? Like a nineteen hundred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I do that all the time too. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a long time ago, but I did a number of plays in New York. Uh, and. Um, what brought you to California, which is where you are now? Well, the weather. <laughs> I had a I had some family out here. Uh, but uh, it was also the cost of living was a lot less at the time in Los Angeles than in New York. I think it still is, uh, but even more markedly so than when I first got here. Uh, okay, yeah, so it, um, it, it's easier to struggle when when you're not freezing. Right. Um, did you do more of the stage acting back east, or did you continue it out here, or how did how did that work out? I started with stage acting back east, and then I, I continued it out here. Uh, I uh, did get a, a few commercials after coming out here, and um, uh, some a little bit of film work, but still been mostly stage. Okay. But I, I do get film parts occasionally. So how do you how do you mm -hmm. compare the how do you compare the acting work for yourself? Is it harder to do say commercial versus film? versus stage, or is there a preference? Well, um, you know, uh, film and commercials pay your bills more than stage acting does. So, uh, you know, uh, I think most actors will tell you they do uh, theater, live theater for their soul and uh, film and television to pay their bills. Um, but in terms of the, of the art of acting, is it, you find it more challenging to make, say, you know, 50 takes on a movie and 150 takes on a commercial versus, you know, every night is a, is a new experience on stage? Well, you know, I, it, 
in that regard, I would say that uh, film and television are possibly more relaxed in, 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 that, uh, in that perspective, because if you make a mistake or if it's not perfect, they can do another take. Whereas, you know, uh, theater is live and um, uh, if you mess up, you're humiliated. You, know? <laughs> you, you get immediate humiliation. You get, you get either in, uh, instant gratification or instant humiliation, depending upon uh, how well you do in that particular evening. Yeah, but do, do you find the live experience more, you know, more fun? I don't know if that's a good word, because usually if you make mistakes, you've got to pick, pick it up or, or somebody might help you, bounce you if you forget yeah. a line. Uh, what's uh, gratifying about live performance is that you have a live audience there with you and um, you're sort of exposed to their energy, the energy of your audience. You know, if your audience is with you, there's no, no greater thrill. Uh, wow. Do you have a form of theater that you prefer over another? Drama, comedy, musical, um, that kind of thing? Well, I prefer to get anybody who will cast me, but uh, anybody who will cast me, but uh, I don't know. Um, I sort of enjoy comedy. I think I enjoy comedy, really. So. Okay. Um, a lot of actors uh, feel that comedy is probably the hardest form of, uh, of um, you know, acting. Well, they said there's a famous story about that. It was uh, John Barrymore was on his deathbed. And somebody came and asked how he was doing. And he said, dying is easy. Comedy is hard. Okay, I never heard that one. Oh, oh cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things you, had, uh, you have done. And let's start off with this wonderful headshot. That's, uh, that's do you go by Phil or Philip prof professionally? Yeah, Philip professionally. Okay, so when was this taken? Is this fairly recent? It was taken a few years ago. The photographer is the wonderful photographer, Ed Krieger, who does a lot of production photography uh, in, in Los Angeles as well. Okay. Um, what do we have here? Now that is from uh, a thing we did, I guess a year before the pandemic hit. Uh, <laughs> that is at Theater West. Uh, we did uh, It's a Wonderful Life as a, in the style of a live radio play. Right, and Theater West, that's the theater that's in, is that Studio City or Universal City? What is that called, considered? Uh, yeah, I guess you, you would call it the Coenga Pass. Yeah, is, right. It's very, it's, very, it's very close to Universal Studios. It's, yeah. in between, it's in between Universal Studios and the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, it's a great the, little theater. Um, now, I, was this a radio, this, you said a radio play, right? Yeah, that's the same show. Um, it's, it's a wonderful life. And what was your character? You're the announcer or various characters? I, I did I did a, a number of characters in different voices and uh, I, I would, would play like uh, the uh, the cab driver and I played uh, uh, one of the Baileys who was running the bank and and uh, right and for those who don't know in the audience who are watching a lot of stage productions of radio plays are done that way where one actor will play four five six whatever parts. Um, and as a result, gets to do accents and characterizations and things like that. Um, and they do it in front of a live microphone as the original radio plays were done when you were sitting at home and listening to your radio, which I don't know if anyone does anymore. Um, although audio books are coming back. Uh, a lot of people like audio books um, and people do voiceovers and things like that. So uh, just for people who didn't know, um, I guess this is the same. Um, who's the actress? That's Tammy Taylor. Okay, uh, she looks angry. <laughs> we missed the part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dandelion wine. I've heard of this. I haven't oh, seen. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, again, I, that was another one I played uh, several characters in, um, and um, I was with uh, Ray Bradbury's theater company. It was called the Pandemonium Theater Company, and I was uh, with Ray's company for eight and a half years. And I was also Ray's publicist during that time. Okay, uh, for uh, his plays or everything? Uh, pretty, much, pretty much for everything. Uh, everything he did in Los Angeles. Yeah, uh, again, for those who don't know, Ray Bradbury was a, is a, was a world famous uh, science fiction author, uh, notably tons and tons of really good books. 
and a lot of his stuff was adapted uh, for the theater. Did he write the stuff for the stage, or was he co-writing with anybody? Uh, he he wrote this one. Uh, yeah, he he wrote uh, he wrote um, most of the things we uh, that that of his shows that were done in in Los Angeles were his scripts. Okay, um, I love the uh, look on this one. Obviously, a period piece, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was. Um, we used uh, for Greentown, uh, that was, I think, 2007. We used stories that were not used in the stage production of Dandelion Wine. So this Greentown was also uh, based on Dandelion Wine, but, uh, and it's unlike the a stage version of Dandelion Wine, there, were, there was no science fiction aspect uh, okay. to, to this piece. So are, are, these, are these shorts or one acts or are they full like? you know, uh, two, two act plays or what? Well, um, it was, he sort of weaved several stories with the same characters so that it flowed as one continuous piece. Okay, so it was all one act for like an hour and a half or just yeah, we, broke I, if, if I remember correctly, we, uh, we did this in two acts. Two acts, okay. It's been a while, but you know. Uh, and I played the- uh, Barber, looks like. Yeah, town Barber, yeah, the town Barber, Mr. Wynecki. Uh, the town barber uh, and uh, this this was a world premiere. This one, uh, Danny Lion Wine had been around for a couple of decades, but uh, this was a new new work. Uh, All right. Where is uh, the Fremont Center Theater exactly? It's in Pasadena. Uh, it, it is owned. By, it was the South, South the uh, Fremont Center Theater is owned by James and Lisa Reynolds. Uh, James Reynolds is uh, one of the stars of the daytime drama Days of Our Lives. And uh, I guess with his TV money, he and his wife, uh, his wife is also a, a stage and film actress. Uh, uh, they uh, bought this corner in South Pasadena. It's a very charming community. Now this one. That's uh, certainly, yay. Yeah, this is, this is from Theater 40 in Beverly Hills. Uh, Rod Sterling's uh, Stories from the Zone. We got, uh, now Theater 40 secured the rights to a couple stories from Serling's daughter, uh, Anne Serling. We were not allowed to call uh, the show Twilight Zone and we were not allowed to use the famous theme music, but we had the rights to the stories, uh, to a couple of the stories that we it, got from Serling's daughter. Is that why it says Rod Serling's stories from the zone? Yeah, we, we couldn't use the word Twilight Zone because uh, uh, CBS owns that name. Oh, uh, but uh, uh, some of the stories were the uh, intellectual property of the Sterling family. So, what do you is this? This is called "Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up." Yeah, that's a famous episode. That's from a famous episode of of the, the uh, Twilight Zone. You're in the middle. Are you the Martian? No, no, no I'm not. Um, you can tell us who is it. Which one? It's 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 it, it's the guy behind the counter. Really? Mm -hmm. The, the cook, the chef, whatever he is? The... He's, he's the real Martian. Yikes. Okay. Um, this is, oh, same play. Same play. Uh, although now the guy in the suit is actually, it turns out, I'm, 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 spoiler alert. Okay, the guy in the suit is from the planet Venus. Uh, okay. And, and, uh, and the guy behind the counter is from Mars. So are we set, in terms of the story, are we set somewhere on Earth and they're visiting, kind of exploring? Yeah, this is, just, this is like um, a roadside cafe and, and, and everybody snowed in. Everybody got off, a, people got off a bus because uh, they were snowed in. It's, 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 oh, it's, I think it's, I remember this, actually. It's a roadside cafe, I believe, somewhere in New England. Now, this is also from another story. This is set in the Old West. And... Um, are you the sheriff? Do I I'm, see a star on you? I'm the sheriff, yeah. I see the star <laughs> on you. Uh, and, um, you can uh, give us a little bit of the story. That's, yeah, uh, well, the, the fellow in the long coat, that's uh, Richard Large, and he plays a, 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 a itinerant huckster, and he's saying that he, um, he can bring people back from the grave. And, of course, the... the uh, the joke at the end of the story is that he actually can. Yeah. Uh, he thinks he's just conning these people out of their money. 
uh, but but he, he's actually more powerful than he realizes. Wow! And and, uh, and at the end of this, at the end of the piece, some people come back from the grave to get revenge. Uh oh! So so these are Rod Sterling kind of stories that were either written or you know written for the show or whatever, and you kind of put them all together in like a what a four part. We took two. Uh, we took two episodes. Uh, these two episodes, uh, Jeff Rack, who, who co-directed the show. Uh, uh, Jeff Rack corrected the directed the uh, well, the real Martian. Please stand up. He directed. He adapted the scripts from the uh, television scripts. And Charlie Mount directed uh, this one, the the Mr. Gary in the Graves, the the Western piece. Right. Uh, I got to tell you, I miss seeing live theater. This is the kind of stuff I like. Uh, yeah. In terms of, you know, performances and whatnot, um, but uh, and uh, yeah, I would tend to get cast as sheriffs for a while because uh, I yeah. also, I was also yeah I also played a, a sheriff in uh, Theater West production of the the Petrified Forest. I think you have, you might have one picture from that. Okay, uh, this guy looks like Willy Wonka on the left. It's, is he the same guy? No, uh, no, he's the guy who played the Venusian in, in the uh, the other other piece um, but he's he's just a, a townsperson uh okay uh, and um okay now this, now this one is is um uh we did this is uh from production outdoor production of the tempest uh from dean the production company is the dean productions theater and did you say uh, outdoor yeah this was outdoor in, outdoors in, in, a, in the in the park brand park in glendale uh, oh. from, uh, a couple years back, and uh, yeah, Dean Productions is a company. Uh, they do community outreach, and uh, they specifically cater to. Uh, what What is this scene here? What are we looking at? What part of the Tempest? Um, well, I play Gonzalo, and I was like the um, the king's counselor. Mm -hmm. um, and you know uh, we're all shipwrecked. So, okay. Uh, and again, uh, there there was some cast doubling, uh, but my uh, uh, this is a scene. Uh, this is the scene I mentioned earlier. I'm playing uh, the sheriff in the production of the Petrified Forest at uh, Theater West. Wow. And, you look angry. Yeah, well, you know, it's it was really we we come in at uh, near the end of the uh, uh, second act. Um, we're going after uh, a gang of robbers, and uh, um, yeah, my uh, two deputies. That's Ern uh, it's uh, Donald Moore on my right and Ernest McDaniel on my left. Okay, now this is also a Bradbury piece. Um, um, Abraham Lincoln. That's Abraham, yeah. Uh, Gay, Gray Schmidt. And uh, he is like a, an animatronic uh, Abe Lincoln uh, in this piece. And it's, uh, this is from a show called Almost Midnight. We did this at the New Place Theater in North Hollywood. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Where's New Place? Where's that? I don't know if it's still still operative, but it was on Violent Avenue in, in, in North Hollywood. This is some years back. Oh, okay. Um, Are you the uh, scientist who built him? Is that what we're looking at? Uh, I'm operating the, the robot in this piece here. Yeah, uh, it's a Bradbury piece. Now, Bradbury did not consider himself a science fiction author. He considered himself an author of fantasy. Okay. Uh, and uh, he'd be the first to tell you that he's not a scientist. You know, unlike some other um, writers of, of science fiction who are, like Isaac Asimov, and I believe H.G. Uh, Wells. <laughs> well, uh, but uh, there he is! Yay! And we took that shot in. Um, this picture was shot in August of two thousand and one. Uh, and who's that handsome man on the left? Well, that's me. When you might much. <laughs> Yeah, much in yourself, and uh, we shot this. How, is he a pretty nice guy? Is he easy to deal with? He was like everybody's favorite uncle, you know. Really? Yeah, um, and um, almost every actor I know who 
We work with him, love working with him. Yeah, down to earth, approachable, that kind of thing. Very much so. He he loved theater. He loved actors. Uh, I think he's that's his favorite necktie. It's got a bunch of pumpkins on it. Uh, really? Okay. Hall Halloween's his favorite day of the year. Um, as you might guess from some of the uh, stories he wrote. Uh, well, it's, it's, good, it's good to see that or hear that a world-renowned uh, author like Ray Bradbury is, you know, down to earth. Because some, some people get a little unapproachable when they, you know, sell millions of books. Uh, uh, that's, that's true. But, uh, you know, he loved uh, meeting his fans. He, 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 you know, he, he would do a lot of book signings. He promoted libraries wherever possible. He thought that um, li he, he was, you know, he educated himself at libraries because he couldn't afford to go to college. I mean, he, he wound up with a bunch of honorary degrees from colleges later, but, um, you know, he self-educated himself by going to the uh, library, principally the Central Library down in downtown LA. Uh, and uh, they, named the street outside the uh, Central Library's Ray Bradbury Square oh, um, nice. after him. Uh, the other library that's also associated with him is the one in Rancho Park. It's where he used to take his daughters on Saturdays. Um, Very cool. Um, this Oh, another play. Fahrenheit yeah. 451. So they, they adapted his book into, the, into a play? Uh, yeah, he did. He did. Uh, and um, this was, I, I was actually, the date of this production though. When, when was that? The date of this production was 2008. This was at the Fremont Center Theater. I was in one other production of Fahrenheit 451 uh, in 2002 uh, at the Falcon Theater uh, in Toluca Lake. Uh, this, is, this shot is from um, uh, 2008. Uh, it was very successful at the Fremont Center Theater. We ran it for there for seven months. And uh, we could have run it longer, but there were other plays that were scheduled in behind us, so we had to close. Uh, <laughs> the wonderful ice cream scene. Ice cream. Now, I have, I have lost 15 pounds since that production. <laughs> I, I no longer quite have that kind of abdominal bulge anymore. That tummy. Is that all the ice cream required for the role? Well, <laughs> actually, what did it for me was M and M's and French fries. But um, ooh, okay. But your doctor loved you. Well, <laughs> I so but I wound up um, going on a diet and exercising. I took off fifteen pounds, and, and now I don't have that big tummy anymore. Right. And am I looking at the guy next to you? Is he holding up neckties? Is that what I'm seeing? Uh, yeah. What you're seeing is neckties. Yeah. Uh huh. So what's the story here? What's going on? Um, well, these um, these young Latino fellows, uh, they want to uh, they uh, want to become more self assured. They want to court beautiful women, or they want one of them wants to become a political speaker. Um, but then they see this beautiful white suit. Uh, in the window of a, of a men's clothing store. And they can't uh, afford to uh, buy it. So, the, uh, so what they do is they pull their money and they buy the suit and they share the suit. So uh, each uh, one of them gets the suit for like a certain amount of time on a particular evening. And then they, the suit gets passed off to the next guy. Is the suit magical or what's going on? Well, the suit is not actually magical, but they ascribe magical powers to it. And what it really is, is that it's such a, they look so good in the suit uh, oh. that they, they their self-confidence is built up in each case and uh, they become the best version of themselves. And they think it's a suit when it's actually them coming of themselves. Exactly. That's that's the idea. But you know, it's the one. Cool. It's, it's a white. I think it's the ice cream suit because it's, it's it's a dazzling white suit. Now um, you, you you this is two thousand nine, so it's over eleven years ago, or about eleven years ago. How come yeah. how come I don't how come I don't see a lot of theaters doing these kinds of plays? It sounds like the stories are timeless, and it sounds like the stories are meaningful. I mean, uh, 
are the rights for Bradbury production pretty expensive or what? Um, well, he was our producer, so that took care of the rights. Uh, I mean, Ray was the producer. Uh, he, he partnered, now at the Fremont Center Theater, he partnered with, uh, on several of the productions with uh, Raquel Lerman of Theater Planners, who is an act, still actively producing now. Uh, she, uh, but she was his co-producer because in his later years, uh, Ray was in a wheelchair. And uh, so Raquel. So these plays aren't available? They're not published for people? Oh, other yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. The plays are available now. Um, his literary agent is in New York, uh, Don Congdon Associates. It was his literary agent for his entire career. And um, the uh, uh, Congdon Associates uh, controls the rights uh, to his literary works. Okay, I just wonder if they're like too expensive for like high schools to do them or like yeah. I said, I, I, I wonder why a lot of other theaters aren't uh, picking them up unless they're expensive, which is usually I, I, why. I, I don't know, you know, um, um, I don't know what the rights are because since Ray was our producer, we didn't have to worry about the rights. They were his. It was they were his properties. Uh, okay. I I did now back in uh, 1993, I produced an evening of short stories by uh, there was plays um, by um, Isaac Bashev Singer, who was a Nobel Prize winner, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those rights the the rights were fairly expensive. For those, um, we were adapting them. Um, the adaptations were by Joseph Meagle, who I believe is uh, at the University of North Carolina now, but back then he was out here in LA. Uh, but I, I got the rights from uh, Isaac Shevisinger's publisher, uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Uh, they're a publishing house uh, based in New York. Very cool. Um, All right, let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, you had sent me a couple links, and this particular production of, um, I guess, the Ramona doll. What's what's this about? Are you in this? Yeah, I'm in this. Yeah, it was about a uh, young woman who wants to be a model, and uh, I'm sort of, I'm sort of her her mentor. Um, my character is is blind. So oh. Really was based on a true story. Uh, and uh, looks like this was published three years ago, 2017. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, it was a few years ago, I guess. Yeah, uh, 2000, 2017 sounds about right. Okay. We shot, we shot it in, uh, well, we shot my part of it in uh, my, we shot my scene in one afternoon. Uh, down in uh, San Diego, uh, and I'm not in the early scenes. I'm sort sort of like the, the girls in her teens, and she's um, huh? so I become mom, I become her mentor, and that, so I'm, I'm featured in the latter part. Uh, I believe this is you, right? No, that's not me. No, it's not me. It's just no. I mean, in this scene here, that's that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. We shot this in a coffee house in, in San Diego. Very cool. One one day shoot. Well, my part of it, you know, the, the earlier scenes in the, were, uh, I guess, a shot in someone's home. Uh, nice. Okay. And then let's talk about this. Sweet, short and sweet. What yeah, is short and sweet is, I, I was the uh, publicist for the Short and Sweet Festival in um, 2018 and 2019. Uh, now the Short and Sweet Festival is all over the world, and um, so uh, it's been in Hollywood for a few years. It's actually started in Sydney, Australia, uh, but now it's in in, in 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 countries all over the world. In so it's a, it's a festival of plays, a festival of films. What is it? It's a festival of short plays and films, but specifically short pieces. Uh, okay. The uh, average length, I guess, about uh, ten minutes or so, or twelve minutes. Really short stuff. 
Um, so there, it's a festival of short plays, film, yeah. and dance. Um, the local home for it was, we did it at the uh, last couple of years, we did it at the uh, Lee Strasberg Creative Center in West Hollywood. Um, I think before that, before I became involved with it, they were at the uh, Stella Adler Theater in Hollywood, but they moved to the um, uh, Lee Strasberg Center a couple of years ago. And it's a, it's a lovely space. And now, the, Gloria, uh, Gloria Gifford, I've, I've been to several of her productions. Yeah, so. Gloria Gifford Conservatory, that's uh, at Santa Monica and Wilcox. Uh, she was in North Hollywood for a while. How long has she been in Santa Monica? Uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard, I guess she was did did her first season in Santa Monica. The first thing I did with her was at the uh, she had rented out the Matrix Theater. This was back around 2005, when they did the uh, West Coast premiere of uh, Stephen Adley Gurgis's play Our Lady of 127th Street, and um, Our Lady of 121st Street. I think it is. Sorry, I got the title wrong. Uh, and um, then uh, she had uh, moved to the complex for a couple of years. And then she was at, at this, uh, had a location in North Hollywood. And then uh, she had been renting theaters and then she got control of this one space on Santa Monica Boulevard and, and started uh, putting up shows and, and seasons of plays and of course, uh, she's still teaching uh, classes virtually during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I've but, seen I, every one of her productions. I've seen it was in one of, I think, two theaters in North Hollywood. Yeah. Um, I, I'd heard she moved, but I, I never heard where or why or what. So is it, is it more than a couple of years or 2018, 19? When is it? When did yeah, she? Yeah, around that time, around that time, I guess. Around, okay. Uh, okay. And you became her official publicist then, or are you? Been, as I say, I've been working with her pretty much since two thousand five. Uh, oh, okay. So I've worked with that, with her at four different locations now, but uh, this was a space that was she could, you know, that was um, she wasn't just the tenant; she was the primary. You know, it was under she, it was her space. Right. All right. I want I want to switch gears here a little. We we talked a little bit about your acting. And Obviously, the many productions we've been in. Let's switch to the PR, the public relations side of it. So, um, how do you, how does, for those who don't know, first of all, what, what do you do? Ex describe what you do as a PR person. Uh, well, uh, primarily, I get media coverage for your show. Um, you know, I get, I get your show noticed. I, I get, it, I put it out there. Yeah, you know, I get, I get your show listed in a whole bunch of places so people know where. That you have a show where you are. Uh, I How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I've compiled a uh, media contact list over the over with several hundred contacts over the years. Uh, I've, and you kind of blast out the projects that are there. Yeah, I've, and I know you send out. I know you send out PR, you know, sheets or pictures and things like that, meaning uh, images of the show or the production, so people can promote it. Uh, as a reviewer, those came in great handy in terms of uh, you know writing about the show or. Uh, that I would see, but yeah. uh, how do you go about figuring out what to say? I mean, is that all, that's you, right? You write the blurbs, you write the... In most cases, in most cases, I usually start out by reading the script and oh. then I write something intelligent about, uh, the questions that critics ask me most, most often is what's the plot? Right. I, said, and I, I say, well, if I, I tell you the whole plot, there won't be any surprise left. He says, we don't want to be surprised. We want to know the plot. Of course, the producers of the show say, don't give it all away. So I try to strike that balance, a balance yeah, between. Keep it between also, in your, in your PR stuff, I love the stuff. You give a little bit of background uh, sometimes on the directors and the actors involved or the producers. Give yeah, them yeah mostly the directors and the writers usually uh, because I try to keep, uh, I try to uh, keep the uh, uh, press releases to a certain length uh, being aware that editors don't have ex expansive attention spans. <laughs> so I try to accommodate them. And we've been talking about um, theater a lot, but I want to mention uh, I, that there is a boutique movie house in Hollywood that I represent uh, called the Cine Lounge. And um, they've been on 
Sunset Boulevard, um, uh, 6464 Sunset Boulevard uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, they're kind of like a, a, a deluxe art house theater. They show a lot of genre movies. Now, obviously not during the pandemic, although you can re- you can currently rent the theater for private screenings. Uh, the when you uh, say when, when you say they show genre films, are you referring to things like Rocky science Hulk? fiction, horror, uh, mystery? You know, um, so films that have already been made. This is not new stuff. Yeah, yeah, film, okay. films that are made, but a lot of independent films, uh, stuff that's. Uh, including some low budget things, things that say uh, Lemley didn't book. Okay. Uh, or Lemley is an independent theater chain that, that yeah. uh, usually promotes new independent films. Yeah, well, yeah. we occasionally do the classic films at, 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 at Cine Lounge, but it's mostly new stuff. Okay. Uh, we, do, we, do, we do occasionally have the you know, uh, Hollywood classic. Uh, but we do something. Would they do things? Would they do things like host the Rocky Horror Picture Show? You know, where it becomes a big event. Um, we occasionally have premieres with the filmmakers and the casts of the films. So they do the red carpet thing. Uh, so we do that, and um, which you might not, you know. Uh, again, they, these pictures tend not to be among the like blockbuster budget things. So uh, the, uh, on the regular theater chains might not do a red carpet for pictures like this, these, but we'll do it there. Uh, but the, the seating is super comfortable. They have a gourmet line of popcorn, which is keeping the theater afloat during the pandemic closures. Now Cine Lounge plans to do, uh, as, as long as the, uh, uh, pandemic extends. They're planning to do drive-in uh, films at their old location on Las Palmas in, in, the, in the parking lot there. The, the uh, concept is to, do, to allow 25 cars in a night and screen some of these art house movies there. Uh, Have they figured out the logistics? How are they going to do the sound? Uh, I think they figured out the logistics. They're just waiting on the licensing now, which they expect to come any week now. It's, it's, it's a matter of filling out an endless supply of applications and licensing strictures and things. Uh, and I'd, be, I'd be more curious in learning how, how technically, I mean, obviously they're going to project the, uh, the, the movie, uh, but how do you get the sound? Uh, in the old days, there used to be these little things you put on your window. What are they doing now? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Uh, I haven't been told that yet. I've only, I've only, I only learned about the plan for the drive-in screenings. Um, well, def- uh, definitely let me know when you find out. Yeah, as soon as I'll, yeah, check it out. I'll be writing releases for it as soon as it's, as soon as the licensing is approved. But we expect that to come within days. Okay. Uh, we're shooting this in November of uh, 2020, so we expect us, we expect the licensing agreements to come in days, and then we're going to start showing movies uh outdoors uh, wow yeah when I, like i told you i i miss live theater and watching the live performers the thing about the movie houses i miss the popcorn i really do miss the the the, the movie popcorn so yeah. well yeah. cinema lounge cinema lounge man, manufactures its own brand of of gourmet popcorn in i think 10 different flavors and um but how do you get it can you is it online or what yeah, you can get it online, and uh, the um, it's at arenascreen.com. Uh, you can uh, order it there. Arenascreen.com. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, for people who are watching, I'm, I'm going to ask you two, two separate questions. So if somebody's watching and saying, hey, I want to, I want to, I'm considering acting. I want to either whatever age they are, young or, or you know, my age or whatever, I want to, I want to try acting. What advice do you give somebody? especially during this pandemic time, what, what, what can they do? Um, well, find a good school or find a good teacher. You know, um, it, 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 it's, it's a craft, so there's something for you to learn. Um, okay, so through schools? I mean, because well, Zoom, you mentioned earlier, Zoom is pretty much taken over, you know, in, in terms of uh, on, 
um, you know, the Brady Bunch style uh, casting or, or yeah, or, but you know, um, um, still, you know, I mean, given the things in the news about promising vaccines, it looks like we're looking at the end of the tunnel. So theaters, I would think, should start to reopen like by the middle of 2021. Say like, like next summer in, in 2021, I think you're going to start to see the theaters reopen. But in the meantime, we um, prepare by going to a good school. Uh, we have, you know, universities here, U USC, UCLA. Very cool. All uh, right, let me, let me flip now the second part of that question. Somebody wants to do, uh, you know, get into public relations. Somebody wants to help theaters, movie houses, whatever. How, do, how does someone learn that craft or get into that field? Um, well, again, you know, there are universities that teach these things, um, but uh, you could go online to the, uh, like, I'm, I'm a member of the Public Relations Society of America. And if you go to their website, uh, you could find educational resources. Hmm. Um, there is a professional credential called the APR, which is uh, accredited, ac accreditation in public relations. That's what it stands for. Um, but there are other, there are various colleges here and around the country that, that, that teach it. And uh, I, I'm assuming a big part of it is all social media. You're, uh, you're, you're now, it now it is, now it is. It wasn't when I started, but now it is. I mean, I started back in 1904. Yeah. <laughs> now compared, you know, compared to when you started and now, I mean, I guess you were what faxing and, and mailing, you know, uh, snail mailing things. Do you find it easier now that you can tweet and uh, who knows, you know, Instagram and all that, Facebook, or is it more work? Um, it's cheaper because you're not spending a lot of money on postage. Uh, but because uh, you've got a lot of resources now. Yeah. You, know, you can put the word out in, in one second on five different platforms. So, exactly. So, um, yeah, you need to be somewhat savvy about social media. Um, what came in uh, good for me uh, was that I had writing skills, which I acquired in college. You know, okay. I took I took courses in writing, so I can write a press release, and you're going to know what my show was about, and you're going to know how to buy tickets, and you're going to know what the address of the um, uh, right. It's the same kind of thing copywriters do who, in the advertising agencies where they get these, you know, have to pull these concepts together and then, you know, get the word out, figure out how to say it so people understand it. Um, and usually in short bursts. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you can't make your press release too long or nobody will read it. Um, but. Um, I've gotten a few like 10 page press releases from people. And I'm like wondering, what are they thinking? <laughs> um, you don't have time to read an encyclopedia, but I mean, they're giving you a history of the show. But I, I need, you know, I need the little bites. So, I, when, and for me, when I write the review, I just want to kind of give the blurb that I need to, and then talk about the production. So, well, you can include the history of the show in your playbill when people come to see the show. There, it's. Have you written a few of those playbills for people as well? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. That's I haven't done that. Okay, that's usually for the production, right? Do that. Yeah, it's usually for the for the production to do that. Do they run it by you? Have you ever said, "Don't do this" or rewrite that? Or, no. Oh, uh, they might re, um, run it by by me to make sure that things are spelled correctly. You know, it's the first law of publicity is you know say anything you want about me, but make sure my name is spelled correctly. <laughs> And nowadays, what, what I'm used to seeing is with the actors listing and directors and all this, they have their, their own little websites or the, their tweet address. Or, and it's like, it's really turning the corner of, of how, you know, not only can you learn about the actor in these little blurbs, but you can, can literally contact them or tweet them, or whatever. So yeah. it's uh, a little more intimate, I think. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know. Uh, it depends on the uh, performer's tolerance for, for. Uh, Don't bug me. 
you know, if you say, you know, if if you if you love to be on on, on the web all the time, that's okay. Uh, if you okay. Wanna, if you want to keep your life really private, that, that's a different that's a different situation. Okay. Um. I, I mean, for me, this was a great time talking to you. Do you have any like last words or closing comments you want to make? Let everyone know uh, or something we we didn't cover. Well, I want to mention about a, a couple of the other theater companies that I work with that were doing okay. where they work. Uh, the Sierra Madre Playhouse uh, has turned to, they're doing um, only American playwrights, but uh, they're also uh, focusing on inclusion. Uh, the Sierra Madre Playhouse is in the San Gabriel Valley, which has a large Asian American population. So in our last season, we did the Joy Luck Club with uh, uh, they had one white guy in it and, and a dozen Chinese American actors. Love uh, that play. And, and, you, and yes, and but in, unlike the movie, our 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 Chinese uh, actors were played by Chinese American actors. They weren't you know a mix of of, of different Asian nationalities. Uh, and um, we have a, a another Asian American play uh, that will be early in our season once we can reopen after the pan pandemic. It's called King of the Yees by Lauren Yee. Uh, and uh, I believe it's about her family. Um, so that's gonna be like, and, and then we're, they'll do a, a play called Silent Sky about female astronomers at the turn of the 20th century. It's a, a fact-based play uh, uh, about the women who are professional astronomers. Uh, the uh, another company I've been with for a very long time uh, is um, the Roby Theater Company uh, that was founded by Danny Glover and Ben Guillory back in 1994. I've been with them since 2001, and they focus on doing stories of the global Black experience. And uh, they're continuing to do uh, things, uh, virtual shows online during the pandemic. Uh, they're going to have a Kwanzaa celebration, I think, on December the 11th. Uh, and their uh, website is theRobeTheaterCompany.org. Uh, another one, other company I want to mention is the LA Women's Theater Festival. Another company I've been with since 2001. Uh, they're devoted to um, a female solo performance. That's what they're about. And uh, they're also very inclusive. Um, I've seen several of those uh, series, and let me tell you, they knock your socks off. Yeah, and they're doing. They're continuing doing doing things online, um, and their 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 big festival is usually in March. Well, they continue to do things throughout the year, but their big festival in March this coming year will likely be virtual because we don't expect to be at the country really quite ready to do. Um, the big thing yet, uh, you know, the, the big live performance yet. And also, uh, we'd again, if you're going to do it live, we'd have to be able to do it in a theater which would accommodate full capacity because of the expense of doing live presentation. Right. Uh, yeah. Wow. Very cool. Um, so, I tell you, I really appreciate you uh, doing this with me. Um, I learned a lot. I think everyone watching is going to learn a lot, um, especially about the, the PR stuff and, uh, of course, your history as an actor. Um, anytime somebody shares their experiences, it's always educational to, to learn, maybe uh, take something with you or remember. You mentioned a bunch of schools, which a lot of other people did not, and I thought, you know, that's clever, as well as um, teachers who are doing things that are doing them virtually which is another resource for a lot of people. Um, and, uh, and just so everybody knows, I'm gonna put a lot of uh, uh, Phillips links into um, below here. So you can check out some of the projects, including the ones we saw just now, as well as some other things he's doing. He sent me a bunch of links, so check them out. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, just make sure you put them below and I'll be happy uh, to forward them to Philip or to um, you know contact him via his information below. That's great. Um, I just want to say again, thank you, um, Philip uh, Sokoloff. I've known you for quite a while. Um, I, I hope to get back into the theater swing, please, please. Uh, although I want to wait, I want to wait for the, the vaccine. I'm not. I'm in no hurry to get sick. So, um, 
especially with this little bug. But um, anyway, I just want to let everyone know, um, just in case you haven't heard, I have uh, several of the shows. I have the unboxing of the Geek Authority, uh, which is where I open stuff up for the first time and you see them for the first time, as well as I have uh, my mysterious chamber of collectibles where I collect things that I have from, like Phil says, many years ago, pull them out of the closet and show them to you, um, as well as uh, this show here, the Geek Authority show. Uh, again, Philip, I appreciate the time. Um, and this was great fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. It and, was. Uh, absolutely. So um, thanks everyone for watching and uh, let's say bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.